Morning to you. How are you doing? It's Sunday morning, the 23rd of February, 2020. As the sun shows its face in Salford here in Greater Manchester. Horrendous weather we've had for uh, the best part of the last week, but it seems to be brightening up in good old Salford. Hope you're having a good weekend. How are you doing? Are you well? Are you well this morning? Might be the evening when you're listening to this. My name is Richie Allen. This is Sunday View. Let's have a look through the UK Sunday newspapers and let's listen in to the morning talk shows as well. Good morning to you. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and triggerwarning.tv. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, your host, and you can talk to me directly through Twitter. Send me a tweet, I'll be glad to get it from you this morning. My Twitter handle has never changed. It is at Richie Allen Show. That's my Twitter handle. Yeah, the sun has got his hat on. Looking a bit better. I was out at the crack of dawn this morning and it was belting it down. But it's, uh, it's improving now. I actually got up at 4.40am this morning. Now, if you've been around me long enough, you'll know that there's a smell off of me. No, there isn't. My personal hygiene is exemplary. Exemplary. Now, I got up at 4.40. I don't sleep anyway. I, if, if, if you've been around me, you'll know that I've had sleep problems my entire life. But I've, I've got a very... I don't know, philosophical approach to it. I don't get too bogged down by it. But I got up at 4.40 this morning to watch the fight. Yes, indeed. I did Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, MGM Grant. It's about 20 years since I stayed up for a fight. And I thought I won't stay up for it because I'm in my mid-40s now and I don't have the constitution anymore to stay up all night. And I went to bed and I did sleep a bit, got up at 4.40 and watched the fight. I used to do it all the time as a young man. If, in fact, if I, if I think hard enough, well, I've already thought hard enough. I think the first time I ever did that was when I was 10 years old back in 1985 when marvellous Marvin Hagler fought Thomas the Hitman Hearns in Caesar's Palace in the war. One of the craziest three rounds of boxing you'll ever see in your life. So I like a bit of Las Vegas boxing. And uh, Tyson Fury, Manchester, of course, uh, big big deal to Mancunians. Tyson hails from Manchester. He's a traveller, of course, and he beat Deontay Wilder in Vegas this morning. So I was watching that, stayed up, so I did. And um, yeah, and Bernie Sanders was also, there you are, it's a lovely segue. Jesus, you're in fine form this morning, gammon. The BBG, not the BBC. I am in fine form. There's a segue for you now. Tyson Fury into Bernie Sanders. Well, Bernie Sanders won in Nevada. He won in Nevada. And because of that, it's increasingly likely that Sanders is going to secure the Democratic nomination. Sanders was robbed of it four years ago by the most evil woman that ever lived. Hitlery Clinton. Hitlery Clinton. And it's looking like this time he's going to get a shot at Donald Trump. If you're interested in this stuff, you know how I feel about it. Here's Sky News reporter Ian Woods. You'll hear Ian, and then you'll hear a bit of Bernie. Can you feel the burn? Thank you. Senator Bernie Sanders is a long way from winning the Democratic Party nomination. But the question now is, who can beat him? And let me introduce to you the next First Lady of the United States, Jane Sanders. He and his wife Jane had already headed from Nevada to Texas, which will vote the week after next. In Nevada, we have just put together a multi-generational, multi-racial coalition, which is going to not only win in Nevada, it's going to sweep this country. He polled twice as well as his nearest challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden, who still thought that was worth celebrating. You know, the press is uh, ready to declare people dead quickly. 
Um, but we're alive and we're coming back and we're gonna win. Mm. Biden, Biden doesn't actually sound like he believes himself, does he? Creepy Joe. Creepy Joe with the wandering hands, of course. So what about Hillary then? Michael Rivero, our friend, told me last week that it's a possibility. Michael didn't say he thinks it will happen, but he thought that it was was optional that Hitlery, of course, dubbed Hitlery by the wonderful Gerald Salente, that she might join the Bloomberg ticket as his running mate. It's unlikely now. I wonder will Clinton play some part? There are those who believe that Clinton will enter the race late on. I'm not so sure. Anyway, let's move on. Six minutes past 11. Sunday View with the BBG himself. Me big baldy head in me. The Sunday Times front page headline. House of Lords expenses spiral out of control. House of Lords, the upper chamber. Do, do I have to give you a brief overview of what the Lords does? No? Okay, I won't then. <laughs> I won't. I've done it too often. If you don't know now, you'll never know. Lords, peers, what do they do? Well, apart from allegedly passing, giving a seal of approval to any legislation passed by the House of Commons, or sending it back to the House of Commons for further debate and for amendment. Apart from that, and this is all alleged, by the way, mostly what the Lords do is fart, snore, and belch their way through their days, lying back in the pews, arms a-stretch, the belt unbuckled so the little fat belly isn't too uncomfortable, they sleep, they snore, they fart, they belch, they soil their underpants and they're pretty useless. And for that, they get paid about £300 a day. <laughs> oh yeah, wonderful. So here's the story in the Sunday Times then about the Lords. Sunday Times has analysed what's going on and it has found the Times that the cost of peers' expenses and daily attendance allowance rose by 29% last year to £23 million. Pounds. Oh yeah. And in a triple hit for taxpayers, according to the Sunday Times, the average tax-free payment was £30,827, which is higher than the median salary of a worker in the UK while 31 lords claimed more in expenses than the standard take-home pay of an MP. 31 lords, farters, snorers, belchers, useless sacks of excrement, claimed more in expenses than the average take well, the standard take-home pay of an MP. And now they're going to get a pay rise of 3.1%, <laughs> meaning that for turning up, at the House of Lords every day, they'll now get £323 and not 300 Wow. There's a new round of peerages to be announced and, wait for it, after the new announcements, there will now be 834 farters, snorers, belchers and underpants soilers in the House of Lords. Lovely. Wait for this. There's a guy called Lord Cunningham. He's a former Labour minister. He claimed a total of £79,437 last year. These are official figures now. What did Cunningham do for that? For, for nearly 80 grand? Well, he spoke on 17 occasions <laughs> when he was awake. And uh, he checked in on 159 out of a possible 160 days. Laughing. They're, I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to swear. Be Jesus. Nice work if you can get it. Here's Sarah Vine from the Daily Mail. Uh, she's Michael Gove's wife, interestingly enough. Michael Gove, of course, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. Michael Gove, Penfold, Boris Johnson's mate. Yes, yes, she's his wife. She writes for the Daily Mail. Here she is on the House of Lords.
Speaking with Andrew Marr. Personally, I think the House of Lords should be probably dropped in the North Sea at this stage, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, there are 800 of them, and there's this huge story... Of 834. ...story about expenses spiralling out of control. Why have we got 800 people in the House of Lords? We haven't even got that number of, of MPs. I mean, they're completely unelected. Well, at unelected. one point, it was over 1,000. They are oh, coming yes. down it's bit by bit. I mean, and, one, and see, some of them are getting paid... Uh, you know, I mean, I know how expenses work, so some of the expenses will be for things like secretaries and, and so legitimate yeah. things. But, the, the you know, the idea... It doesn't look... Good. I mean, some of these people are claiming more than the average annual salary of an MP yes. in expenses. I mean, it's not... That if you're a person of a suspicious nature at this mm. point, you might think, hold on a second, all the institutions that constrain or push back against this government are under attack yes. one after another. It's, mm. it's the senior civil servants, it's mm. the House of Lords, it's the judiciary, it is, the dare I say it, even the BBC. Um, what do you say to people who think there is a really aggressive centralising agenda going on? I think, well, I mean, I think... I, I, I don't think this... I think the House of Lords... Is not uh, that's not the case because this this has been around for a long time. I mm. mean, we have this story every pretty much twice a year. Too many people in the House of Lords. It's costing too much. They're not yeah. really doing very much. Um, so I think that's a, that's a separate thing. I think that there's there is. I mean, there is clearly definite definite. I mean, he's got a big majority. He's trying to get stuff done. He's doing mm. what he wants to do. Um, and of course, people are going to disagree with it because in the past, you know, without we've been so used to having years and years and years of governments with very tiny majorities who can't mm. really. Do do anything and this is what this is what a big majority looks like i'm afraid yeah that was the sunday times that was sarah vine michael gove's wife the sunday express headline is eu are divided and distracted so the express today says that it has been told by a source could be anybody that uh, eu officials seem to be divided and distracted ahead of talks with the uk negotiators because for the next nine months, ten months, they're going to try and negotiate a trading arrangement, a trade deal. We are in a transition period now. We haven't properly left the European Union. And that transition period ends, allegedly, on December 31st. Between now and then, they're supposed to thrash out a trade deal. And the Express alleges today, the Sunday Express, that European Union officials are divided and distracted and it mocks, does the Sunday Express, the chaos of the EU budget summit, which you might or might not know, ended without any agreement on Friday last. That's the Express. The Mail on Sunday is obsessed with Prince Andrew. That's probably no bad thing. It has continued week in, week out since Andrew's car crash interview on Newsnight with Emily Maitlis, when among other things he said that he didn't sweat during the period he is alleged to have been at Tramp nightclub with Virginia Roberts Jufre. Oh, it was car crash. Remember? You do remember. Since then, the man on Sunday has been going after Andrew uh, pretty much every week. So today, its front page leads with Royal Guards questions over Andrew Alibi. Hmm. Because in the last week, Randy Andy turned 60, didn't he? Didn't he? He turned 60. There were apparently a lot of no-shows at his birthday party. A lot of no-shows. Sorry, Andy, I'm, I'm out of town that day. I'd love to be there, mate, but I'm out of town. The last thing in the world I fucking need is to be photographed coming out of your party, son. So a lot of people didn't turn up. According to the Mail on Sunday, a very highly respected former Royal Protection officer has raised questions about Andrew's alibi for the night that he allegedly had sex with Virginia Roberts. You might remember, Andrew said he took his daughter Beatrice to Pizza Express in Woking. But this guy, this former Royal Protection Officer, says, well, no. Because Andrew said, I took her to Pizza Express, then I came home, and I was home all evening. Took her to Pizza Express in the late afternoon, came home, and I didn't stir. Well, the Royal Protection Officer says, that is bull spit. That he was out till after midnight that particular evening. Hey, also in the Mail on Sunday today is an account by a man called Steve Scully who worked for Jeffrey Epstein on the, well, we, what do we call it? It's called Pedo Island now, right? Right. Um, Steve Scully worked for Epstein. He maintained Epstein's communications on the Little St. James 
uh, Ireland for Epstein. He looked after his internet and phone and all of that. And this guy, Scully, who's 70 now, says he witnessed Andrew groping Virginia Roberts, kissing her and holding her hand. But he said she didn't appear to be resisting. But it still flies in the face of Andrew's claims that he never met the woman, or at least that he has no recollection of meeting her. So that's the Mail on Sunday. The Observer. Starmer warns Labour, unite or face a generation out of power. There are three Labour leadership contenders. Lisa Nandy, Rebecca Long Daly and Keir Starmer. And I think we'll know uh, next month which of them is going to be facing Boris Johnson across the dispatch box at Westminster. Three of them. The bookies are saying Starmer's the favourite, but I haven't a clue and I don't really care. But I know you do. So I, just for you, we'll, we'll talk about it very briefly. Starmer says we need to pull together. And he attacked Boris Johnson, calling him dangerous. We shouldn't caricature him as a clown, he said of Boris Johnson, because he's very dangerous. There you are. We will hear a bit from Lisa Nandy a little bit later on in the programme, so do hang on to your hats. Sunday Telegraph front page, top civil servants on Tories hit list. This is an allegation in the Sunday Telegraph that Boris Johnson wants to replace a number of very senior civil servants, permanent secretaries, because they are at odds with basically what the Conservative Party wants to do. Civil servants don't share the same vision for the country as the Conservative Party, which of course won a sizable majority in the election in December. So according to the Sunday Telegraph, top civil servants are going to be booted out. The Sunday Mirror. Brit Barmaid is quizzed by Maddie Cops. Madeleine McCann. Wow, 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 wow. Wow, we. I mean, Jesus. What are we now? 2020. This happened in 2007. I was in Spain at the time. I was living in Spain at the time. I'm amazed that we're still reading about this. Personally. According to the Sunday Mirror, police have been speaking to a British barmaid to get information from her about a German guy that she was seeing around the time that Madeleine McCann vanished from the apartment in Praia de Luz, Portugal, of course, back in, as I just said, 2007, 2007, nearly 13 years ago. I mean, it's astonishing that we continue to hear about this all these years later. And I have a theory. Here's my theory now. Um, for, but my theory is not what you might think it might be. I haven't a clue, a clue, how could I have, what happened to Madeleine McCann. But here's my theory. My theory is, is that the UK police as a whole, or the Met Police, I believe that they do not believe Jerry McCann and Kate McCann. That's my theory. I mean, I'm probably wrong. I mean, I'm wrong about a lot of things. But I can't imagine too many other reasons why the police would want to keep spending money on this. She's one child. Thousands of children go missing every year in the UK. In care, believe it or not. Oh yeah, we've gotten into that many a time on the Richie Allen radio show. Thousands of children go missing. Vanish into thin air. Why did they persevere with Madeleine McCann? My guess is, and I have no proof of course, I... I'm thinking that the police do not believe Kate and Jerry McCann. I haven't a clue. Personally, I don't really have any opinion on it. I remember being in Spain, in España at the time, and the expat community in Spain, the Brits and the Irish, and even the English-speaking continentals, the Germans, the Danes, are all fascinated by this story. And here we are 13 years later still talking about it. Front page of the Star on Sunday is a photograph of a man with an animal that he shot, a dead zebra. And the headline is, Gun Cop is Sick Trophy Hunter. And this is an allegation that a guy called Peter Jones, who has worked for the Metropolitan Police, is organising trophy hunting. He's offering people the chance to shoot animals on game trips in Africa. Which, uh, look, I'm not going to virtue signal. You know what I think about that. It's disgusting. That's in the... Star on Sunday. You've got to be a psychopath to want to kill something for sport, right? 
Sunday people, I've been given a death sentence. It's about a grandmother called Susan Clark on the front page of the Sunday people. She is in jail in Portugal for eight years. Uh, well, she should see, uh, do, she should do an eight year jail sentence. She was sentenced to eight years for smuggling cocaine. She's known as the cocaine smuggling granny. And she's 71 now. Her husband went to prison too. She believes that she won't see the light of day again, that she will die in prison. I've been given a death sentence, she says. And very briefly, in other news, um, this is in one of those you just couldn't make it up story categories. Um, A daredevil in America, a daredevil pilot, has been killed attempting to launch a homemade rocket in the California desert. This happened yesterday. The man who uh, was known as Mad Mike Hughes, Jesus, Mad Mike Hughes crash landed the steam powered rocket just after taking off yesterday. And there is a video on social media showing a rocket being fired into the sky before hitting the ground. Mad Mike Hughes was trying to prove that the earth is flat. And he wanted to prove that theory by going to space, excuse me, going to space and uh, getting the proof and then coming back down to Earth and blowing the whistle on the flat Earth thing. Mad Mike Hughes. Yeah. All righty. All righty. And what else is there? What else is there? There's plenty. Right. We've got so much to do, I better just move on. Let's briefly talk coronavirus COVID-19. In Italy... In Italy, the country has introduced what the BBC describes as extraordinary measures to tackle coronavirus. The Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte announced this yesterday, these new measures, because in Italy they've um, got 79 cases of coronavirus, allegedly. So they've panicked, or have they? And these measures... Introduced last night by Giuseppe Conte, the Italian PM, came after two people died from the virus, two Italian citizens. So what have they done then? Well, they've basically quarantined two towns in the north, in Lombardy and Veneto. Well, those are two regions, Lombardy and Veneto. So they've quarantined a dozen towns and 50,000 people have been told to stay at home or risk being arrested. Mm. The Prime Minister Conte said it's forbidden to enter or leave the towns under quarantine unless you're given special permission. All school and sports activities have been suspended. Uh, A Serie A football match due to take place today. That's the Italian top division. That's been cancelled as well. And the Prime Minister has said police and the armed forces, if necessary, will have the authority to enforce these regulations. And this is why I said from the beginning, and I'm always wrong, so take what I'm about to say with a massive pinch of salt, I think this is a feckin' drill. It's a drill, I think, what's happening. I'm not saying that there hasn't been some viral outbreak. I don't know if there has or if there hasn't. I've got to be suspicious because of every other bloody outbreak we were told about over the years, which amounted to nothing. So I don't believe them, but I don't know at the same time. I think it's a drill. It's an effing drill. Get people. Get people into the mindset. Get people to... Get people to understand that they can be told, you've got to stay at home. You can't go here, you can't go there. For any reason. A drill, I think. Now, that being said, we've heard last week about the possibility of 5G involvement because of 5G being rolled out in Wuhan at the very outset. Interesting for sure. I'd never dismiss anything, as you know. I don't know. I don't endorse any of that. I just don't know. But I'm going to talk about it again next week. Not to mention the incinerators there. Not to mention John Rappaport and the air quality generally which is pretty awful at the best of times. I just don't believe a word of it, personally. But I'm not telling you what to think. So there you are. In the UK on coronavirus, the latest is that UK citizens who had been evacuated from Wuhan in China will um, see their isolation come to an end today. 
Now those are the people that were sent to Milton Keynes. So a couple of weeks back, a lot of people, about 100, or is it 200 people, were sent to Milton Keynes and their quarantine is about to come to an end. Jenny Longdon is in Milton Keynes for Sky News and she filed this report. Uh, 118 people have been here at Kent's Hill Park Conference Centre and Hotel for the last two weeks. Uh, they were placed in quarantine. All of them flew back from Wuhan, the epicentre of the coronavirus outbreak in China. Uh, and so as a precaution, they were taken here, kept uh, inside in, uh, in separate rooms for two weeks to make sure that they didn't actually uh, contract the virus, that it didn't develop in the time that they've been here. And that that's extremely important, obviously, um, to make sure that they don't um, develop any symptoms. Now, you can see here, uh, taxis and cars have been uh, coming in all day, all morning to pick people up and take them away. Uh, so it must be such a huge relief for the people in there to be uh, given the all clear and being told that they can go home. We have actually, uh, just in the last few minutes, spoken to one of the men that has been in there, a man called Paul, who's been there uh, for those two weeks with his wife. Uh, he said, huge sense of relief. Uh, there has been a, a good camaraderie in there for the last two weeks. They've had games to play, uh, Netflix, uh, things to watch on TV. Uh, so they've been uh, kept entertained whilst they've been in there. They've been given food uh, and uh, plenty of, of other activities, including uh, basketball, football outside uh, to play. So uh, they have been well kept in there, but obviously extremely relieved to be uh, able to go back home and see their family now. Um, and obviously this has been uh, precautionary, but also hugely worrying for, for many of the people to make sure that they don't uh, get any of these symptoms of the coronavirus. Uh, this particular man we spoke to, his wife, uh, is actually from the Hubei province. Uh, her family, her parents still live there. So a worrying time for many people here who do have connections in China, but a great relief for them to be able to go home. Uh, there has also been a great response here in Milton Keynes from the local community. Where do you hear this bit of virtue? signalling. When I heard this this morning I just shook my head. Listen to this. Teams from the local community uh, a Facebook group was set up especially to entertain the people inside. So uh, messages left, questions left, uh, just little bits to try and entertain them as they ah, spent uh, two weeks here local, at, at this conference centre. Local people set up a Facebook group to help entertain the people inside the compound. Jesus Christ almighty. Oh my God. It's vaudeville, right? They might, I'm surprised they didn't hold candlelit vigils outside for them. Did you see those vigils in Germany last week? I mean, what the fuck is wrong with people? When, when the far-right um, gunmen uh, gunned down um, Muslims outside the Shisha bar. You know the story last week. Driving candlelight vigils in different parts of Germany. For what? Ah! People are so easily controlled, aren't they? They're so easily influenced and manipulated, huh? Huh? Right, this is Sunday View with the BBG. My name is Richie Allen, 28 and a half minutes. Past 11, it is. I'll be back with you in uh, around about 60 seconds. Do a tweet the programme. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. And a very good morning to you. You're fairly quiet on Twitter this morning. You're fairly quiet. Maybe you stayed up for the fight yourself, maybe. Hi to William and Elgin, where it's windy. How you doing, William? William believes that the amount of money being thrown at 
the McCanns is down to the fact that Jerry McCann is a Freemason, says William. Hence the continued amounts of millions, he says, they get when other families of missing kids get nothing, get nada. Follow the money, says William. Uh, you might very well be right, William. You might very well be right. I certainly don't have any special insight at all. Like I said, my guess was that the... Uh, somewhere. I know what I know for... I, I can't say I know for a fact. But I know from what I've heard over the years that some Scotland Yard detectives, some of the um, higher-ups in the ranks there, don't believe the McCanns. I get asked all the time, what do you think, Richie? Do you believe the McCanns? I haven't a clue. Haven't a clue. I've watched videos, I've read articles, various theories about the McCanns, and I haven't a clue. I've never seen anything that would say to me, well, this is definitive proof that she was taken by a barman, this is definitive proof that she was taken by a local gang of paedophiles, or this is definitive proof that her parents were involved. I've seen nothing like that. I don't know. But of course, like everybody else, I'm fascinated by the fact that they won't drop it 13 years later. Hmm, exactly. Good morning to Base Ninja. Good morning to Susan. Right, let's um, move on. No, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll have a tune. We'll have a tune is what we'll do. And after the tune... We'll, um, the really interesting story in the Telegraph about uh, artificial intelligence. There's a vaccine story in the mail, and then we'll hear from Lisa Nandy. This is Sunday View with me, Richie Allen. Good morning to you. Never saw the cure. Cannot believe I didn't go to see them when they were at Manchester Arena about a year or so ago. I'm sure I'll get another chance. The cure close to me, the Richie Allen radio show, Sunday View with me, Richie Allen, 25 minutes to midday. Here's a couple of very interesting stories before we hear from Lisa Nund. Inside the Sunday Telegraph, but it's featured on the front page. Here's a headline for you now. Fears over police AI to identify future criminals. Now, if you've listened to a Richie Allen radio show, you'll know, uh, you'll know of this. Because we've, um, you and I, we've looked at this, haven't we, you and me, you and I, you and me, over the years. Pre-crime, we've talked about it, pre-crime. Edward Malnick has written a brilliant piece in the Sunday Telegraph. Police are using artificial intelligence, he writes, to predict which youngsters could be drawn into violent crime in a major government-funded trial. This is creepy stuff, right? It, it is, it is. Yeah. It's Huxley and Orwell... And every science fiction writer ever all rolled into one. Let's use artificial intelligence to help us predict which youngsters might be drawn into violent crime. Then let's violate every human right of that youngster. Let's follow him or her, tap their phones, hack their computers and their emails, maybe plant listening devices on them. This is scary shit, this, right? But it's not surprising. We've known this was coming. It's a computer model designed to identify low-level offenders who might go on to commit high-harm crimes. Those are quotes, by the way. Identify low-level offenders deemed likely to go on to commit high-harm crimes. And then they can intervene. So the program, the artificial intelligence program, will intervene and tell the police, this guy over here, we think he's going to commit a crime. Madness. Madness. Madness, right? Madness, because there's no opposition to it. Where's the Shami Chakra and Barty and her pals from Liberty saying, what's, what's going on here? Are you really going to let machines determine whether or not somebody is going to go on to be a criminal, a serious criminal, and what are the implications of that? Not a dicky bird. How long before somebody gets detained then? Watch Minority Report. I can never remember who wrote Minority Report, the story. Never. Even though I've read the name a thousand times. Steven Spielberg made the film. Tom Cruise is brilliant in it. How long before somebody is detained? Even for a short period. There's a high probability there, Eamon. Eamon. Don't know where I came up with the name Eamon. Or Michael. Or Mary. 
high probability that you're going to do something you shouldn't do this next, this forthcoming weekend. So we're going to put a little bracelet on you there. We're going to monitor your movements and you can't leave the house. How about them apples? Nothing to see here, please disperse. Artificial intelligence. I'm on about big pharma gangsters. We love the big pharma gangsters, don't we? Wait till you hear this horse shit in the mail on Sunday today. This is the sort of stuff that makes you mad. I'm not going to rant. I'm not. I'm not going to rant. I'm not going to get upset. This is the sort of shit that makes you mad. Not at Big Pharma, strangely enough. Not at the monstrous pharmaceutical companies, no. But at the fucking sheep who take this stuff on board and never question it. What's the latest from Big Pharma? Well, the latest is that you can get mumps even if you've had the MMR vaccine and every 18-year-old should have a booster jab to prevent life-changing side effects. What kind of fuckery is this? Yes! Yes! We gave you the MMR vaccine. We called Andrew Wakefield a liar. We destroyed his fucking career even though his linking of MMR with autism was initially peer-reviewed and everybody agreed with him. Yeah, but then we destroyed him because we couldn't have that. Now we're saying that it didn't work. And that you could still get mumps anyway. So when you turn 18, well, when you turn 18, you should have a booster jab. Another vaccine. What kind of fuckery are you? Let's never stop giving ourselves vaccines, eh? This is unbelievable. Again, I don't blame the, the, the maniacs of the big pharmaceutical cartels. No! I blame the fuckwits of the highways and byways of England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales and Outer Mongolia who say, oh, okay. Hey, hey, Jimmy, your Brian turns 18 on Saturday, doesn't he? Did you hear about that? He might need to get the mumps jab. Crazy. They're also bringing Wakefield into this. They're saying that there are two categories of people. There are the people who got the MMR vaccine, who actually got it, they have to have a booster. And then the ones who didn't get it because of the fear, you know, concerning the autism link back in the 90s. So we need to get, we need to buy in loads of mumps vaccines. Loads of them now. We need to buy them loads at the cost of billions. I mean, we need to tell every 18-year-old in the country that you have to have. Well, not that you have to have, because they're not going to make it compulsory, but they're going to recommend it. And their recommendations are going to be very strong. There'll be a lot of pressure, won't there? Again, how soon before they start saying to people, you can't come to work, you can't come to college, you can't come to uni, you can't go to Disney World until you show us that you've had your fucking vaccinations. Are you 18, yeah? Yeah, did you have the mumps booster? No, I didn't. Well, you can't go to the match because you might infect somebody. But there's no fucking chance I'm going to get the mumps. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We have decreed that even though you had the MMR vaccine, even though you had it, there's a good chance you could still get the mumps. So you got to have it again. And you might have to have it again when you're 40. I mean, it's absolutely crazy to me. Again, I don't blame the psychopaths who walk up and down the corridors of GlaxoSmithKline. No, I don't. I blame the sheep. And you know, if you've been with me for years, you will know you can count on one hand in years of making programs like this, you can count on one hand when I have insulted people by calling them sheep. I don't like it. I don't do it because it's counterproductive. But they're fucking sheep! And they'll fall for it. 18, yes, you better get the mumps booster. Fucking horse shit, huh? Huh? 18 minutes to the top of the air. It's in the mail on Sunday today. I think it's in other newspapers as well. Pretty soon. And coming to a town near you, you will have to prove that you've had your vaxes and your boosters or you will be deemed unsociable. And you won't be able to do this or to do that. You want to see... You want to see Billy Eilish, do you? Or Eilish on Saturday, do you? Have you had your vaccines, have you? You haven't, have you? Well, you better go and fucking get them or you won't be going to see Billy Eilish. 
We live in a tyranny, you see. It looks fucking lovely. Everything looks all right. It looks on the up and up. You walk outside your door. You don't have the fucking Stasi at the end of the footpath, the end of the street. They're not there. Not visually, but they're there. You can't see them, but they're there. Encroaching, encroaching, encroaching. It all looks on the up and up. Oh, I've got me boxing. Tyson Fury. Oh, I've got me football today. I've got me rugby. England are playing Ireland. I've got me few beers. Everything is okay. It fucking isn't okay. Oh, God, no, it's not okay. 16 and a half, 17 minutes to the top of the hour. My God. I, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> if you had the MMR vaccine, you can still get the mumps and you should have a booster. Who says? Big Pharma. Ah, right. I sure they have nothing to gain from it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Going to channel my inner Jackie Gleason, Smokey and the Bandit 2. Oh. Breathe, dear. Who could have a child now, eh? Who could have a child? So the Labour leadership contest, pretty soon we'll know who's going to lead the Labour Party. Not that it matters. Keir Starmer, Rebecca Long, Bailey and Lisa Nandy. Now Lisa Nandy was on Sky News this morning with Sophie Ridge. And they talked about the BBC, so they did. And they talked about the media. Lisa Nandy wants to see a more pluralistic media. So do we all love so do we all. And she talked about the demise of local papers and the impact that local papers disappearing has had on journalism. Something again that the big baldy gammon has been talking about for years. Local radio stations, again, it's had a devastating effect on free speech and on a broad discussion of topics. Okay, okay. I don't have time to play you her comments on the media, so we'll move on. Because Sophie Ridge, the presenter, then wanted to talk to Lisa Nandy, Labour leadership contender, about trans rights issues. Cue, cue the hilarity. Now you signed a pledge card from the Labour campaign for trans rights, which calls on candidates to support the expulsion from the Labour Party of those who hold bigoted transphobic views and the same pledge card then goes on to say that Women's Place UK which argues for uh, single sex spaces to be protected uh, is a trans exclusionist hate group. So do you think then that Labour members like Ruth Sawatka who co-founded Women's Place like Julie Bindle who've expressed support for Women's Place should be kicked out of the party? No, I have to say that was the part of the pledge that gave me pause for thought about whether to sign it. But I decided to sign it in the end because I think that the sentiment of the pledge about protecting trans rights and about accepting that trans men are men and trans women are women is really important, especially... Yeah, she said that basically, and and this is scary stuff as well, you know. If you want to be in the Labour Party, you have to accept... The trans men are men and trans women are women. There's, that's binary choice. There's no shades of grey there. You have to sign up to that. Or you don't belong in the Labour Party. And about accepting that trans men are men and trans women are women. Imagine that. Is really important, especially at the moment with the level of discrimination that people face. There is no discrimination. I I don't think that prescribing organisations is actually the right way to deal with um, disciplinary issues in the Labour Party. I think that the question for us is always about individual behaviour. And it's right to recognise that there are women who have fought for generations in order to create safe spaces but for women who want to have a proper debate about how we best protect that but you can't have a proper debate you see she's a hypocrite nandy doesn't want to allow real women real women the women that have a vagina a natural one the one that they got when they were born right nandy doesn't want to allow them to debate you just heard her you just heard her It's not up for debate. Trans men are men and trans women are women. Therefore, they should enjoy the access that women get to women-only spaces, so on, so on, so on. Right? Right. In an era where we've recognised that trans men are men, trans women are women, and we've got to do far more to protect trans women from harm as well. Um, I I want to see us have an open debate. I don't want to... But you don't want an open debate, love. You just fucking said you don't want an open debate. So there's no place for anybody in the party if they don't believe the trans men are men and trans women are women. 
don't want to see us close down debate and I don't want ah, any- you're fucking, but that's what you're doing anybody who's listening to this to think that I do but I represent people in my constituency including a young girl who's currently going through the gender recognition process right she's talking here now about a young girl in her constituency who's going through the gender recognition process this is where Sophie Ridge lets herself down she's not a very good presenter yes and it is horrendous Horrendous, she says. Horrendous, the level for the girl going through the gender recognition thing. Discrimination that she is currently facing. And where there are people who represent people in my constituency, including a young girl who's currently going through the gender recognition process, and it is horrendous, the level of discrimination that she is currently facing. And where there are people... Astonishingly, Sophie Ridge doesn't challenge Nandy to give us an example of the horrendous discrimination that the girl in her constituency is facing as she wants to change her gender. Amazingly, Ridge doesn't jump in and say, well, give us an example of, tell us, tell us how that manifests. What is the discrimination? Just to say a word, just sits there. There are people who say she, A, doesn't have rights because she's trans, or B, doesn't actually exist because there is an argument that is being prosecuted that trans people don't actually exist. That is unacceptable behaviour. Nobody should be expected to be in the Labour Party and hear that said about themselves, and that's where I want to see action taken. Crazy stuff, eh? You have no place in the Labour Party if you do not believe that a man with a penis can be a woman. If you don't believe that a bloke with a penis can be a woman, you have no place in the Labour Party. Any more? I mean, you clearly feel very passionately about supporting the right of trans people, particularly, of course, after listening to the cases in your constituency. Um, but I guess some feminists would feel that after signing this pledge card, which is talking about the expulsion from the Labour Party of people who hold transphobic views, and then going on to say that Women's Place UK is a trans-exclusionist hate group, that is shutting down the debate. So if that gave you pause for thought, do you think you should have signed it? But I think that pledge cards themselves have become a real problem in... So why did you fucking sign it then? ...problem in British politics. And, and I think, with hindsight, if we could have all signed a pledge card at the beginning to say that we wouldn't sign pledge cards, we'd probably be in a much better place. Because oh, one of the ways that pledge cards have been used is to pit people against one another. We've you think? We've seen it happen with Brexit in recent years. We've seen it happen with the Israel-Palestine debate within the Labour Party in recent months. And actually, it surely must be possible possible for us to have a better level of debate than this. I spent years before I came into Parliament working with young people for the charity Centrepoint. She's a bit thick, Lisa Nandy, like all politicians. She's not able to articulate that which she wants to say. She's talking about binary choice. Now, we've always had this. It's been around since man... I don't know where man came from, so I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road. But since we've been here, we've had it. But we've never had it like we have it now. Binary choice. It's... um. Been around, as I said, but now it is being used everywhere to silence people and to shut down debate. It's being used in public forums, in news interviews, newspaper columns, social media. Binary choice, either or, either or. There is no room for nuance, no room for, well, um, yes and no. No, no room for that. Most of us go through our lives saying, well... Yes and no, but you can't do that anymore. You're either for us or you're against us. Are you for gay rights? Well, there's no room for, well, it's either yes and you are okay, citizen, or it's no and you're a bigot. Well, it's not no because everybody should have rights and nobody should be discriminated against because of their sexuality and if gay men and gay women want to get married, they should be allowed to civil marriages, civil unions, all of that, of course. But I, I'm i not too comfortable with, as I've said a million times on the programme, with same-sex adoption. Ah, you bigot! You big, baldy, gammon bigot! You hate speech bastard! No, I, I don't hate anybody. And what they want to do is they want to remove nuance, remove, remove analysis of anything by making everything binary choice. Do you support trans rights? There's no yes or no answer to that. That's nuanced. Well, of course, if a man or a woman wants to live as a member of the opposite sex to which he or she was born, of course they should bloody well be allowed to live like that. Absolutely right. 
if they want to. And nobody should, they, they should be allowed to live harassment free. And I have the same rights as everybody else in terms of civil rights. But they shouldn't get, for example, trans women shouldn't get to say, well, if I feel like it, I'll go and use a women's dressing room. But no, you fucking don't have that right, you see. But you, you can't say that because it's binary choice. You're either for trans rights or you're against them. There's no, as I said, there's no room for shades of grey. It's crazy. Nandi understands it, but she doesn't understand it. She understands it, but she can't articulate it. She mentioned Israel-Palestine. Do you believe that Israel has a right to exist? Yes or no? But again, it's not yes or no necessarily. The answer is, of course, no. It doesn't have any right to exist. Just for the Zionists listening in this morning. Good morning. Um, But again, it's nuanced. Let's hear some more from Lisa Nandi. Interesting question here from Sophie Ridge. Are you happy for people who self-identify as women to be on all women's shortlists? Are you happy for women who identify as women? (laughs) In other words, men who think they're women to be on all women shortlists. Now, of course, all women shortlists are fucking stupid anyway because positive discrimination is discrimination by its very nature, right? You're not getting the best person for the job. We've decided it's going to be a woman. That's the end of it. You could have a superstar over there, some bloke, or vice versa. If it was an all-male shortlist, you could have a superstar woman. But no, we've decided. Positive discrimination is crazy. So she was asked, do you support men who identify as women being able to take part in or put themselves forward for an all-women shortlist? Let's hear crazy Lisa Nandy. Yeah, I think that... Yeah. You have to you have to walk the walk in the Labour Party, ah! and that means that we have to do two things. One is that we have to accept that people are who they say they are. I've never believed that politicians or even me as an individual should interfere or dictate to people who they are. And this does actually remind me very much of the debate around being gay when I was growing up as a child in the 80s and it really wasn't very well understood and people you know there were all sorts of really offensive things that were were said at that time often quite main by quite mainstream politicians about how this was a choice um you know not innate not something that was part of who people were i think we've moved on as a country and i think with trans rights we will move on as a country as well but we're not there yet so i think it's important that labor leads by example and i also think we need to put far more support in place for people who are going through this process and are exploring their own identity and are coming to terms with that and are learning how to live in a country that so far is far too unaccepting of people who are different. And um, I want to see us do that within the Labour Party as well. There's never been a country more accepting of people who are different than the UK. Again, this is the inversion. It's There's never been a better place to be if you're in a minority. No matter what type of minority it is, great time to be a minority. It's a fucking, a total inversion, you know. Oh, it, it's, it's, it's tough, this, isn't it? In the Labour Party as well. The, the, the process is not right for people out in the country, but let's put more support in place in the Labour Party. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm going to leave it there more or less today, I think. There was a bit more to talk about. We could have talked about Diane Abbott. Diane Abbott. Diane Abbott was on the Sylvia Ridge show talking about immigration. I'll spare you that. And David Davis, the former Brexit secretary, was on the Andrew Marr show talking about Huawei. I'll spare you that as well. It's uh, coming up for four minutes to uh, the top of the hour. That's about it for uh, the programme. I just want to say, I I, I did put a tweet out yesterday. I just want to thank um, you. I want to thank you. Uh, A few weeks back, I asked you to support the trigger warning TV project in Manchester, the... Uh, lads, uh, the office where Trigger Warning is based was broken into a few weeks ago and several thousand pounds worth of the camera equipment and other equipment was stolen. And I asked you to get involved. I asked you, uh, my listener, and I asked friends of mine uh, in the independent alternative media to get involved. And you came through pretty huge. As you know, They the lads did their first programme back at the office, uh, as it were, last Thursday I'm glad for them. And from what I understand, the um, the fundraising overwhelmingly uh, came from listeners to this programme and friends of this programme. So I want to thank you 
from the bottom of my heart for doing that. It means a lot to me that you would pay attention to it and that you would do it. So I really appreciate And continued success to uh, Hayden Hewitt and Graham Booth at uh, TriggerWarning.tv there. Do check out their programmes and check out their YouTube channel, Trigger Warning on YouTube. There's only one uh, Trigger Warning. That's it for me, closing out today's programme with a bit of you too. The sun is shining over Salford. Who would have believed it? We've had a week of nightmarish weather. That being said, I feel guilty even saying that because it's horrible to see people in other parts of the country up to their waists in water in their own houses. I feel so sorry for them. And I'm, I'm guessing you do as well. What a terrible thing to be trying to deal with. I can't imagine... I mean, look, there are a lot of things worse, of course. Death, of course, and famine, disease, of course. But in terms of a family situation, having to deal with that in the winter, in the cold and miserable feckin' weather, um, my heart goes out to them. And, uh, yeah, what, what else is there to be said about that? That's it for me. Back tomorrow, 9.30 with the paper review on YouTube tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m. And the Richie Allen Radio Show at 5 o'clock tomorrow, UK Times, of course. <laughs> Closing out the programme with you too. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Look after yourselves and one another. Until tomorrow, bye from me.